So every word has its own cultural connotations and ideas. And one of the ones that is most uh, common or difficult for us is the word religion or religious. It could just mean, like, in fact, if you were filling out a, a form or maybe your Facebook profile or whatever it is, and they say religion, you would easily put Christianity or I'm a follower of Jesus, you know, in that context uh, that it's uh, that's spe specifically talking about your faith. But when we talk about uh, religion as man-made systems or hopes to attain reach God or somehow uh, gain God's approval or worse yet, control others, we cannot avoid the discussion of religious people. And by this, I want to be very clear, I'm not talking about people who have or claim the faith of believing in Jesus Christ for salvation. I'm certainly not talking about people who've trusted Christ and are a part of a, a local body, but I'm talking about people who are attached even under a Christian guise, to man-made religion, man-made rules. Uh, many of you will know I grew up in youth outreach ministry and was by and large kind of separated from local church, but more so we spent all of our time reaching out to the furthest out kid. We wanted to find the uh, modern-day tax collector or the modern-day prostitute or the modern-day person who was struggling. And believe it or not, even back in the 90s in middle schools and high schools, those people existed. Our goal was to, and we succeeded in seeing people with active drug addictions who were in abusive relationships, who were uh, dreadfully sexually active to the most immoral degrees. We were able to see these kids come and provide a a welcoming place for them to come and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one who died for their sins, that they might be cleansed, that they may be forgiven, that they might be brought into a relationship by grace through faith in the living God. And interestingly, we uh, face less opposition then than now from a worldly perspective, but the most Virulent opposition we tended to face were the religious kids, or uh, we sometimes would call them the church kids. Now, keep in mind, this isn't all the kids who went to church. It even isn't even the bulk of the kids who went to church. In fact, most kids who went to a church also found a, a nice home, a nice place to be in this youth outreach ministry environment because they were in a relationship with Christ. It was a place they wanted to be. But there was a loud, vocal, angry minority of, uh, of kids who were more content to sit around and judge the sins of the, the bad kids. They knew they were a small minority. They felt uh, separated from society by their moral choices or lack of immoral choices. And instead of choosing to view these other uh, young people who are making poor choices with grace, mercy, and compassion, they viewed them as the bad kids, and they wanted to let them know that it was too late that God was closed for business, that they were not welcome if they were going to, uh, based on the decisions that they had made, that there was no space for them in church. It was a difficulty and it was a problem because those who should have been our greatest allies, even if they weren't going to be involved because that wasn't their gifting and their place in the world, they were, uh, those who were meant to be our allies were made useless for the gospel of Christ. Because of their religious attitude, I'm not saying, again, imputing this upon all church kids or all of anyone, but that's, that group of kids, that small group of kids made a greater impact for Christ than anyone else by telling everybody how much God hated them. They made a great impact, but a terribly negative one. Like the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son, they could only look down their nose on those who didn't meet their standards, usually standards that were uh, not entirely uh, biblical in nature. It wasn't all about morality. It was oftentimes about, you know, how many times they showed up at church or who was or wasn't reading their Bible enough or whatever their personal private legalism was that they'd impute upon anything else. And boy, it is my hope that that would never be us, that there would never be you and I who would desire, because of our religious, man-made religion and, and insecurities, 
forbid others or drive others away from the grace and love of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying we ever should sacrifice on the morality, the truth of God's righteousness. That's not a compromise you have to make, but it's a false dichotomy to think that you must, uh, you must reject sinners in order to reject the sins that they do. We can be loving we can be gracious, we can be patient. And that is uh, our, our introduction to today's passage. Our, today's passage we're going to look at in two sections, uh, um, the Pharisees and Sadducees requesting a sign in verses 1 through 4, and the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees in chapter 16 of Matthew, verses 5 through 12. So reading 1 through 4, it says, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. So we come into this interesting situation where they're requesting another sign. But before we get there, we have to note something. It says, then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came. Now, previously, it was the Pharisees that had been sent up, or the Pharisees and the scribes, which, as we've uh, discovered, were, they were kind of kissing cousins. They were friends. They were very um, uh, concordant in their visions and desires, and so it was easy for them to work together. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees were bitter enemies. They agreed about next to nothing in terms of their doctrine and their beliefs or their hopes. You see, the Sadducees were, for lack of a better term, a rich, mostly family-based group of religious elites that were made important to the nation because they were in control of the temple mount and the temple cult, or the religion of the temple, the sacrificial religion, all the priests and all that went on. They were in control of that, and so that made them centrally important. They are actually the descendants though much perverted in time, uh, from, from the Maccabees and on through the intertestamental period, it morphed into these people being in charge. They rejected anything after the Pentateuch or the books of Moses as being uh, authoritative because they were the theological liberals of their day. They wanted to move away and minimize God's words so that they could live a physical, com comfortable life. They didn't believe in the re resurrection. They weren't particularly looking forward to the Messiah. They were there to wait Rome out and live a life of comfort and power according as, as much as they could uh, in light of the idea that there was no real future uh, soul or, or immaterial existence for mankind. You just had to kind of get the best of your best you could get in the time. The Pharisees, by stark contrast, embraced the whole Word of God and were deeply desirous of the, or at least in their uh, verbiage, of the coming Messiah. They made rules and then added rules to the rules and then added rules to those rules to those rules to keep people from ever possibly, maybe even uh, disobeying uh, the law of God. However, within that, they developed a painful man-made tradition that the worst elements of humanity found out and found out this is a chance to bully, control, and manipulate others. We have an opportunity to look better than others and manipulate others and, uh, and, and therefore can gain sort of prestige or power or influence in society. And if you wonder how far will people go, just look at the insanity of the social media world today and the stupidity and the ridiculous lengths people will go to get people to click like or thumbs up on a video that wouldn't even exist if the power grid went out for 10 minutes. We love that, right? Our flesh loves that, that admiration, that attention, uh, and, and, and that was sort of what they were after. And so what we see here is two absolutely bitter rivals in the life of Israel that could finally be united. And what were they united around? Well. Uh, it might not be you, but it might not be me, but it's one of us, and it's definitely not this Jesus guy who comes speaking with real grace, real truth, real power, the one who speaks truth against our 
monopoly and control of, of money and power and religious influence. It's certainly not him. So the, this fact that the Pharisees and Sadducees are able to, are willing to unite against Jesus shows us, one, that war makes strange bedfellows, but also that the enemy was aligning all of his forces while he was glorified by the conflict between these two problem parties, neither of which was truly seeking after God at that time. He was even more glorified by everything standing up and opposing Jesus Christ. And so here, they're going to ask for a sign. Now, if you turn back, don't you don't have to do so, but if you were to turn back to chapter 12, we find this isn't the first time they've asked for a sign. They've asked for a signs on multiple uh, circumstance or circumstances, opportunities, right? And essentially, there's a subtle subtext to this, which is, do a trick for us, Lord. Oh, sure, we've heard what you've said, and sure, we've seen some of your... But do, do another trick for us. Really impress us this time, because if you're really God, then you'll prove it to me by again, these succeeding levels. And I, we do want to note, and this is helpful in understanding uh, what happens when you share the gospel with someone, just as a, a side application for us. There are people who have one argument after the next, one question after the next, and one question after the next, and no matter how many times you answer objections, they'll always report back to the internet, find another objection, and bring that one to you for you to solve. At some point, you might just being, uh, they might just be baiting you, and it can be valuable to ask, if I answer this question, will you be ready to put your faith in Jesus? Or are you just dodging what you know to be the truth? There's a meaningful time, not without grace and not without love, but just to say, look, is it ever going to be enough or are you just kind of trying to waste my time? That's a valuable and, and worthwhile question. And if someone is going to be in this position where they are so dead set against belief, we can follow the example of Jesus and leave them alone. Hopefully not with bitterness or with anger, but just say, hey, look, Jesus didn't seem to have any problem with these Pharisees and Sadducees being disappointed. He didn't run after them and say, oh, but, 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 but. He didn't say, okay, one more. Penguins, you know, or whatever. I mean, I think if he were to manifest penguins, that would be a pretty reasonable miracle, but then none of the ones he did. So we have to recognize that there is a time when at least theoretically they requested that he do something and then they would believe and he said, no, you won't, for very terribly uh, uh, paraphrased. So, um, he, Jesus, in his wonderful and divine way, uh, responds not so much to the question that they're asking or the quest they're making, but to the heart issue by uh, telling them that they are able to read the natural signs. What does that mean? It means that they're able to observe the patterns of what's going on and look and see that based on when the sky is red, they can expect certain weather patterns, or based upon this or that, they can uh, discern what is going to happen. And so, the question that he's asking is, if you can see the cause and effect relationship throughout all the natural world that's designed by God to be reasonable and, and methodical in this way, why can't you make those same observations about what's going on in the world around you? Why can't you discern the times? So we would ask, what is it that Jesus expected of them to have, be, uh, to have been recognizing that they were ignoring or that they had missed? And again, we can't bring this out enough. God expects humans to use their brains to receive input and make reasonable conclusions and responses to what He has let us know. It's part of how God designed this whole wonderful thing to work. And so when Jesus asks a question like this of people, His implication is, is that it, the failure was on their part to do the most natural and basic observation, particularly for those who were, by profession, uh, experts in these spiritual or religious manners. So what were the, was it that they should have seen? Well, this is a very short list. We could go on for the whole lesson, but Daniel, as we looked at this morning, gave, us the time, gave them the timeline. Daniel saw and was recognized as a prophet of God during the Babylonian captivity. 
And it was revealed to Nebuchadnezzar and explained using uh, divine revelation through the person of Daniel that this amazing statue which Nebuchadnezzar beheld in his dream with the head of gold, which represented the nation of Babylon, was followed by the arms and chest of silver, which represented the nation of Medo-Persia, which was followed by the Greek empire, represented by the, uh, the midsection of bronze, and the legs of, of um, iron were representative of Rome. But God didn't just reveal that once in the book of Daniel. He revealed that twice, we could argue even two and a half times. Uh, as, as some of that information is given more specific revelation later. But while uh, Nebuchadnezzar was allowed to see the progress of these nations as a big, beautiful idol in the shape of man, right? He represents the human and, and Gentile perspective and viewpoint on it. It's the great conquering force of man. And we still see that attitude today, right? There's still people who are looking for that great and overarching one world government that's going to bring peace and prosperity to all under the will of one person, one ruler, one board, one collection, right? We still see that gleaming desire from, that, was, that was really stopped all the way back at the Tower of Babel, uh, gleaming in, our, in the secularist uh, perspective, so from the uh, Gentile perspective, from the human viewpoint perspective, they would look up and see all of that as the most glorious empires of the world, each one becoming less valuable because each one provided less, value, uh, less autonomy to the dictator, but more strength. And truly so, each of these uh, succeeding empires were stronger than the last, and they were under that great and fearsome composite beast. Well, let's move on, because when God reveals the same thing to Daniel in Daniel 7, He reveals those same empires, but with animals, ferocious animals. Babylon wasn't a head of gold in Daniel's vision. He was a winged lion, and we think of lions as being beautiful and majestic, and with wings, how much more so? But a lion was a terrifying reality for anyone in the ancient world, in this, or a t an animal that would tear and destroy and kill you. That was followed uh, for the Medo-Persian Empire by a lumbering bear. The, he's lumbering because there is a, co a combination of these two, um, uh, the Medes and the Persians, and the Persians were the stronger. So he lumbered because he had a stronger and a weaker empire that were sort of fused together with three ribs in his mouth for the, the three... Um, satrapies are the, the three divisions of that empire. Um, they have the Greek empire following, right? It's a four-headed leopard, another dangerous animal. If you've ever seen a four-headed leopard, the four heads symbolizing the four divisions of the Greek empire once it comes out um, and its speed as it goes across and so on and so forth. And then the Roman empire, this terrible composite beast with all of the, uh, or many of the characteristics of the others showing this incredible, oppressive, the greatest nation the world had ever seen. They had lived that. Their fathers and their father's fathers had seen those prophecies fulfilled before their eyes. They should have been looking. If that weren't enough, Daniel also gave them the prophecy of the 70 weeks or the 77s that would essentially give them, the, even if they were just bad at math, the absolute assurance that this was the time that the Messiah would be coming. This was the time to expect Him and see Him. Daniel had given them everything that they needed to know and all they had to do is watch. Wait, who's in charge? Could we describe Rome as this great, incredible composite beast that terrifies the world? Yeah, absolutely we can. We should be watching for him. But they failed. Not only that, the prophets foretold signs uh, with, in great number saw that his lineage, both recorded for us in Matthew and in Luke, would have been available there for question. And the very fact that they only have offhanded accusations against his lineage at times, based on uh, the history of what happened and the miracle of the virgin birth, is evidence that nobody could come up. And by the way, this is important because it would be tough for us to do. Like now you'd probably go on genealogy.com or something and you can kind of pretend that you actually know your family tree down to whoever you actually pretend you want to be related to. I don't care. Have fun. But back then, it was a big deal. 
You see, in the temple mount, at the, at, in the temple complex, they kept records, not just the ones we have preserved in our Bible, but many records so that any single person could go and, and, and research the lines down through the ages to get back to specifically this. So, if you were there to oppose Jesus, the first thing you might do is go to those records and write down and say, his genealogy is wrong. And interestingly, both Matthew and Luke for us did what? Probably exactly that. You don't, those uh, genealogies, they didn't just dream them up out of their head. They didn't find them only or exclusively from Scripture. They went and likely did their research. And fascinatingly, Paul, the great, or Saul, the great enemy of the early church, didn't use this as an as a attack against the church. Why? Because it wasn't a valid attack. He could test out the genealogy and follow the line of Mary and say, well, what do you know? That goes back to David. And, and follow the line of Joseph back and say, what do you know? He is the descendant of David on both sides. He is the heir apparent to the throne. He is the Messiah. They knew his place of birth. They knew uh, because of the prophecies in Micah where he was to bo be born. And in fact, he was born there and could defend that claim, which is why those accusations fell flat. He knew uh, they, he had been brought through the miraculous virgin birth, as we've studied in our morning class of late. They knew the, about the witness and the ministry of John the Baptist that was prophesied in, um, in both, um, oh goodness, is it Malachi, and Isaiah. So John the Baptist's ministry had come. He had fulfilled that which was uh, given for him. They'd seen or heard about, likely seen, but certainly heard about the many miracles that he had done. And finally, they experienced the teaching of a true teacher, of one who taught as, as one who has authority and not like their teachers who just recited various traditions and quotes of what other people had said. The writing wasn't on the wall. The writing was on the wall, the floor, the ceiling, and everywhere else. You couldn't miss it unless you wanted to. And these wanted to because they had in their perception more to lose if Jesus Christ is the Messiah than they had to gain in their perspective of the coming kingdom that the Messiah promised. And so Jesus assesses their heart and speaks very directly to them, a special ability of Jesus. He calls them a wicked and adulterous generation. Now, wicked translates the Greek word paneros, and it means evil, bad things, moral evil, very specifically Adulterous draws us back to the books of Hosea, Hosea, Isaiah, really the entire uh, prophets talking about the concept of spiritual adultery. So let's look at that for just a moment. Here is a Jeremiah 3.20. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord God. Jeremiah 3.20. Isaiah 1.21 says, how, faith, how the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. And Ezekiel 16.30, how degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. Not only these passages, but the entire book of Hosea reframes the relationship between God and Israel as, a, God, as a, a, a picture of a man who loves an unfaithful woman who constantly goes back to her prostitution, sells herself into prostitution, and then he lovingly, patiently redeems her again and again. The concept of spiritual adultery burned in the minds of the Jewish people. It was for that adultery, for their willingness to run after idols, to run after gold, to run after immorality, for their uh, willingness to abandon God at the slightest provocation, a promise of greener pastures elsewhere. He used this picture of not uh, reducing the relationship with uh, a man and a woman's importance, but rather ennobling it by saying, look, this, is, this seems like a great uh, uh, betrayal to you. 
when a person violates their marriage commitments. But your violation, Israel, of your commitment to me and my choice of you is far more grotesque, far more disgusting, far more spiritually and eternally grave. And so he uses this imagery and even uses such strong language as uh, talking and accusing them of being spiritual prostitutes. And uh, I was too bashful to bring up some of the more graphic passages of the Old Testament where he talks about the whoring of Israel. This was the reason why they went into the Babylonian captivity, their idolatry and the like. It was the thing that dictated even the religious fervor that did exist in, the, in Israel as it stood. You see, here's the funny thing about it. How were they wicked and adulterous? They were keeping the law better than any generation before them almost without question. They kept the law with such provision that they were making new rules surrounding it. And how could he call them spiritually adulterous? I mean, the entire ancient world knew about and recognized that the Israelites, the Jews, worshipped only one God, so much so that they were reliant upon a legal a codified reality in the Greek and Roman world that Jews were not required to sacrifice to the emperor or any other Roman god because of their religion. Now, that's pretty impressive. Rome didn't make a ton of exceptions, but they made an exception, at least uh, from what we know of history, based upon the exception that Alexander the Great made because of the revelation of God and the experience that he had with Israel when he came to conquer. And they said, we're not fighting. God said you were coming. Go. One really exciting moment in the intertestamental period. But we want to point out, how could he call this generation wicked? How could he call them adulterous? You, you couldn't find an idol around, not for the easy looking. You had to go to the Gentile areas for that. Well, the failures of the Pharisees and the Sadducees we find were far more grave because they were even uh, more deeply internalized. You see, they had defied God's Word by their traditions. They said, oh yeah, God's Word's fine, but we, just, we, we like these extra rules, these extra traditions. These, you know, this is the right way to celebrate Passover. You know, you also have to do this, this, and that, such, such, and so. You know, when you come into the temple, you can't bring your own lamb. You, sure, you, you should really buy one from us. They had uh, perfected the ability to use their traditions to manipulate others, so much to the point that they were willing to come to Jesus since they could find no actual sin in him and say, well, you're, you're, you're not keeping our traditions. And Jesus responded appropriately, again, heavily paraphrased, so what? Because God has nothing to do, and God's Word had nothing to do with their traditions. They had used their traditions to defy God's Word, and that was a failure. They made themselves out to be the authority. They made them or their traditions or their fathers or their, we might say, commentators out to be the authority over the Word of God. And whenever there was any conflict between the, the tradition and the Word of God, they would tend to go with their tradition because that kept them in the driver's seat. They loved to go around as these non biblically appointed. And by the way, that's important. You see, God appointed kings. He appointed prophets. He appointed priests. He didn't appoint Pharisees. They weren't priests. They were a self-appointed group of religious people who rolled around trying to teach and enforce their perspective on the Word of God. We could say often for good, often for faithfulness, and yet here we find that their ultimate motivation and result was not what they might have hoped. They reveled in their self-righteousness. They loved to go from town to town, from place to place, from party to party, and get the most wonderful seat because everybody knew that the Pharisees were the most righteous, the most set apart, the best people you could be in God's eyes. And they reveled in that. They loved that. The reward which they got and the admiration of others for their godliness and piety meant so much more than the praise of God that they couldn't stand to let anyone else in that club. They couldn't stand to show mercy because that would sacrifice the only currency that they thought was worthwhile. God's Messiah 
would have to meet their standards. Boy, there's the big failure. The Messiah comes. He's doing miracles. He's teaching the truth. He comes from the right place. He fulfills prophecy. We should look into this guy. And how do they come? With an attitude that somehow, if this guy's really it, he better impress me. Isn't that the attitude of most non-believers today? If your God exists, he must really impress me. You've got you to be some sort of really impressive action or something that's going to happen to really bring me, because ultimately, I'm the judge and God's on trial. But we have forgotten, just as the Pharisees had forgotten, that because God exists, he's never on trial. We are. And the question is not what you think of God or what do you make of God. The question is what does God make of you and what does God make of me? Finally, they use their religion as a cudgel to get, as we said, fame, power, and money. Or we could go all the way back to Genesis 3 and say that these Pharisees had fallen to the same temptation that was offered to Adam Eve and Eve. You shall be as God's. They had taken the perfect and revealed religion, the faith that had been brought down from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, codified with Moses, revealed through the prophets, and they had reduced it, shrunk it, shrunk it, packaged it, and then used it to manipulate others for their own selfish ends, that they could be God in the situation. Jesus then finally tells them that they will receive no other sign. We do want to remind you that they'd received many signs, uh, likely, poss- very possibly themselves, having seen these miracles. But instead of going through and, tell- and listing these, as Jesus well might have, he points out that there is only one sign left for them. He uh, also already alluded to this in Matthew chapter 12, and he described it, uh, verses 39 through 41. So this is a, repeat, a repetition of what he'd said before to them. Uh, in Matthew 12, he says, And he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in, this, in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, but indeed a greater than Jonah is here. It is uh, well known uh, that the part of the reason why Jonah's testimony was so well received and so effective in Nineveh was the worship and the, the idol- idolatrous worship of fish, a great fish that they had. And since Jonah's God had preserved him in the great fish, that that made his testimony all the more effective, all the more powerful, as his entire appearance and even smell was likely dramatically changed from that, uh, that time, that experience. And yet, they are about to get the final greatest evidence. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the sign, and it is still the sign today. When you are talking to someone, you're sharing the gospel, what do you want to share with them? You want to share with them the, uh, the miracle of the resurrection, the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sin and my sin, that he was buried on the third day. Well, that's just an absolute statement of faith with no evidence at all until you get to the resurrection, that he was risen again on the third day. It is the sign that God accepted the sacrifice, the sign that victory over sin and death had been accomplished, and it is the sign that salvation is now freely available to all who would trust in him and be forgiven for all eternity. It's the sign. It's the big sign that's coming. And we don't know whether these two or a group of Pharisees and Sadducees changed their minds when they saw this sign, but I hope they did. Now we move our attention to the 11 of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, Picking up in verse 5, it says, Now when the disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, You of little faith, O you of little faith, 
Why do you reason among yourselves that you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up, nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak of you concerning, speak to you concerning the bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So first off, Matthew masterfully sets up this story by letting us know that they forgot to bring bread. And I would note that it kind of seems to make sense that they would forget to bring bread. Clearly, over the past, you know, months, Jesus has shown them that he's got the provision thing well under control. Can you imagine seeing 5,000 and 4,000 people, or actually more like 15 and 10,000 people, being fed in a single afternoon going, I am never packing lunch again. Jesus has this under control. Good Bible interpretation uh, probably would have actually enjoyed this or helped them in this situation because then they immediately start worrying about actual bread. But if they had listened to what he said, his, his discussion of leaven and, and the note of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they may have assumed that he was telling them not to buy bread from Pharisee or Sadducee households or, or you know, sources right, because that would be in some way uh, tainted. But if they'd really thought about the nature of this challenge and the, and the uh, placement of this statement, then they would have been able to think and go, well, what, what could he mean? And they did. They reasoned together, but they ultimately came out to the wrong conclusion, which is that he was talking about actual, literal bread instead of a symbol here, using bread symbolically. Um, here he calls them little faiths. This is a single word in Greek. It's uh, used three times. He's been call, he called them, he called Peter a little faith for losing or doubting, rather, while he was walking on the water. He's a little faith. Uh, these, these are now little faiths because they did not understand or remember specifically uh, what, was, uh, what had been done before. So again, Jesus shows that he expected them to understand. That should be... Again, that, that common theme throughout the book of Matthew is important. God expects you to understand. I don't think He expects you to understand immediately. He expects you to continue to take in the Word of God, to think, to ponder, to prayerfully, to uh, think about it and consider what it means. So leaven's a commonly used metaphor in the New Testament, most commonly uh, an evil metaphor. But whatever it is, whether for good or for evil, leaven was something that they didn't scientifically understand. But a little bit of leaven would bring in what we now call the yeast, and that yeast would then transform invisibly over a relatively short period of time all the bread. It couldn't be salvaged. You, they had no process to de-leaven or unleaven bread. Once it was leavened, it was fully leavened. And that was how they kept their yeast supply going and living. Each time you would uh, make a new ball of dough, and then you would add some leaven from your last pat batch, and then that would work its way throughout the dough. And then before you baked it, you'd take another little bit from this batch and put it in that batch. And that's why your mom's bread always tasted different than everyone else's bread, because it was a very specific, different strain of yeast that was unique to your family. And so they had that uh, system for uh, doing things, and it was a symbol for something that could go in and invisibly change or affect everything else. And he's telling them to avoid the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's pointing out that bad teaching, that false Bible teaching, that a little bit of false doctrine works its way into everything that you believe. Now, I can't say this enough. If you had lived in that day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the religious superstars. For the most part, between the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes, and maybe uh, the Herodians, right, the political, who, those who went after political expedience, you really just got to choose a side. That was what you did, right? You got to choose between this all-star team or that all-star team or this all-star team, but as an individual person, you didn't get to make your own team, so for Jesus to criticize the teaching of both of these people who, if we were smacked into the middle of this time period apart from Christ, then, and we were meant to choose, like, okay, so who should be in charge of this thing? We'd probably say, yeah, those Pharisees, they're, 
They seem like the most committed to God's word, the most committed to going the right direction. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. Don't take in even a little of what they're spewing. Beware of the leaven because a one wrong idea, one small wrong idea can go to the very ends of destroying or toppling a good faith. He was telling them to beware of their legalism. They're making rules and regulations over and above and apart from God's Word. He was telling them to beware of using religion as a way to feel superior to others, right? Faith in God, the revealed Word of God, is not here to make you feel better than someone else. If you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and you see the most horrible, sinful, fallen wretch in the world, you have to say with all honesty, but for the grace of God, there go I. The only distinction between that person and me is the fact that I trusted Christ and was saved from becoming that person. And at the end of all things, when God collects all the redeemed from all time, it won't be any single one of them that gets the glory, but God who receives all the glory in its entirety because it will have been His doing. And if we're tempted, and uh, I don't know where your great temptations are, I'll tell you mine, or most decidedly when I'm watching the uh, political theater that's going on. If you're tempted to use your faith to look down on others, please stop. We all need to grow. We all need to grow up, and I'm the first and foremost. Don't ever look at the people that, uh, that we know are working against God without a sense of mercy and pity. They're not getting anything out of that. That's not fulfilling or satisfying or bringing them hope. Even by winning, they lose. And so, pray for those. Pray for those on that other side. Pray for those, pray for anyone who is not in the saving embrace of Jesus Christ. With recognition that apart from Him, apart from His revelation, you'd be just as deceived or worse. They were using their religion as a way to feel superior to others. They were using their religion to control and manipulate others. We see this in the church all the time. Well, Christians shouldn't act that way. You know what? Mind your own business. If you're going to love and support and help someone, like Galatians 6 talks about, if you're going to nurture and desire to restore someone through their sin, you're in the right place. If you just think it's your job to point out how they're goofed up, you're in the wrong place. I'm not talking about physically, I'm talking about spiritually and emotionally. If you don't come with that humility and love and desire to see them grown and matured and restored, then you're in a bad attitude. The faith, the Word of God is not an opportunity for us to research it and, and learn it and figure it out so that we can use it to control or manipulate others' behaviors. It's not what it's for. It's not the design, just as it wasn't then. Uh, finally, they're constantly holding to the, word, the Word of God up to their standard. They would read the Bible, and then they would read their tradition and find out if the Bible, what the Bible clearly said, or the Word of God clearly said, they wouldn't have called it the Bible at the time, the Word of God said, clearly said, matched up to the traditions, their standards, their beliefs, their ideals. And it is the great problem, one of the great problems in the Church of America today. We look at all these inconvenient moral revelations of the Word of God and say, well, maybe that was just cultural. It's not cultural. The Word of God doesn't have to meet your standard. You need to meet the standard of the Word of God. It's the Word of God's standard in our thinking and our perception of others. It's the Word of God's standard in our lives, in our living, in, by, by grace through faith. We do not get to choose, pick and choose which parts of the Word of God we think we like or we agree with. It's not a book of devotional, happy, chicken soup for the soul quotes to make us feel better after a bad day. It is the truth, it is the offers, the worldview which we're meant to embrace and accept in order to grow and live correctly in this sinful and fallen world. So, by way of conclusion, I challenge you. Are you careful who you're listening to? I hear very frequently, and I, I don't, please, if you've said this to me, I'm not pinpointing you. Lots of people have said this to me. 
I don't know. He's a little legalistic, but I sure do like to listen to Bobo on the radio. Don't listen to Bobo on the radio. Oh, Lord, beware the, the, the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. A little bit off is a long way off. Satan doesn't need to get you as a, as a growing, productive Christian well, well off in the toolies. He just needs to shunt you one degree to the left or one degree to the right. So if he's a little legalistic, throw his books away. If he's a little kind of worldly, if he's a little kind of mystical, walk away. Because the tragedy is, is that we are all, every single one of us, influenceable by the, the, by the environment which we put ourselves in. And so it's not a long step from, I really like him, but he's a little legalistic, to, I'm also a little legalistic. Every day I should, I often forget, wake up and praise God. When I finished college, April and I were set. We wanted to go into seminary. I wanted to go into ministry. I was ready to go. I applied to a bunch of seminaries, which I won't name all of which had fully abandoned teaching the Word of God or the Word of God as the final authority. And praise God, a dearly beloved friend, my mentor, Vern Peterman, said, you don't want to go to those seminaries. They don't teach the Word of God clearly. And he brought me to other small uh, seminaries and teaching where I could hear and learn the Word of God. Most importantly, he discipled me and mentored me. Why do I thank God for that? Because I can tell you that if I had gone to those liberal seminaries as a 20, impressionable and ignorant 22-year-old person, I would not be here today standing on the truth of the Word of God. I'd be out there as another, don't use political terms, as another uh, theologically liberal pastor going around chasing after various political hot-button issues of the day instead of standing firmly for the Word of God and the gospel of Christ. I'm not that strong. If I would have chosen or been, been led to swim in those waters, I would have become like those fish. There is no delusion in my mind. You are shaped by who you choose to surround yourself with. So be careful, dear saint, who you let speak truth into your soul. Because a little leaven leavens the lump. Readjust daily. That one degree off, boy, we're all probably way more than one degree off. You've got to check your compass daily. Keep looking at the Word of God. Keep reassessing. Am I, am I heading the right direction? Am I, do I have a clear vision of Christ? Do I have a clear picture of what He's doing? Do I have a clear picture of what He's doing? Continue to come back to the Word of God. Continue to come back and meet with the family of God and talk about the Word of God so that you can reset yourself to true north every day, every day, with humility saying, I might have... I might have missed. I might be a degree off. I might be three degrees off. Come back to the Word of God. As long as we can, as a church body, that's what we're hoping to achieve and accomplish together. To continue to return to true north so that we might not be swayed or perverted by the traditions of men, by the machinations of humanistic theology, by the legalisms and traditions of men. We're not perfect. We're not there. We're going that direction. I hope you're excited to go that direction in the months and years to come until the Lord comes for us. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, how we thank you for your wonderful word, for your perfect provision. Lord, the capacity to be these religious people exists within the sin nature and heart of all of us. It's just something that we desire to look better, feel better, have authority, have control over others, and yet you make it clear that you are God and we're so thankful that we are not. Please give us a fresh vision of your grace, of your truth. Let us submit ourselves to you and your revealed standard and not seek to conform you to ours. How we thank you, our Lord and our God. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.